Thank you, Rick. Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship on the second uh, week of Lent and a warm greeting uh, to those of you who are worshiping with us online. If you are online, uh, please don't be bashful about just uh, chiming in so we know that you worshiped with us here today. Uh, I think I've repeated a lot of these uh, announcements that are in the back of the bulletin. Um, First communion class is one that I'd like to highlight. Uh, if there are youth that uh, are available for that, those classes, that information is up on the top of that second page, uh, and we'll be I'm looking forward to that. So we'll receive First Communion on Monday, Thursday, so a very meaningful time to receive First Communion. I think all of the other announcements are uh, accurate. The, we will not, for Easter, we will not be having a sunrise service, so please scratch, <clears throat> excuse me, scratch that out. Otherwise, all the times are accurate, and um, please take note of all the rest of those. That's it. Welcome to worship, and as we prepare our hearts and minds uh, for worship, I invite the congregation to please stand as you are able. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, the one God who writes the law in our hearts, who draws all people together through Christ. Amen. Held in God's mercy, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Holy God, we confess that we are caught in snares of sin and cannot break free. We hoard resources while our neighbors are hungry and cold. We speak in ways that silence others. We are silent when we should speak up. We keep score in our hearts. We let hurts grow into hatred. For all these things and for sins only you know, forgive us, Lord. Amen. Here now is a flood of grace that out of love for the whole world, God draws near to us. God breaks every snare of sin. God washes away our wrongs and restores the promise of life through Jesus Christ. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. God of wilderness and water, your son was baptized and tempted as we are. Guide us through this season to be open to your blessing 
and the cleansing depths of repentance. Lord, you sculpted a people for yourself out of the rocks of desert and fasting. Help us as we take up your invitation to prayer and turn back to you. In the glory of the cross, your son embraced the power of death and broke its hold over your people. Bless us now that we rejoice in the gift of the Spirit and celebrate the life of your kingdom. Amen. together. O God, by the passion of your blessed Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to be for us the means of life. Grant us so to glory in the cross of Christ that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Be seated, please. Good morning. The first reading is from Genesis, chapter 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, As for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her Sarah, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please read Psalm 22 responsibly responsively (laughs) we all need to be responsible (laughs) you hear you who fear the Lord give praise all you of Jacob's line give glory stand in awe of the Lord all you offspring of Israel for the Lord does not despise nor abhor the poor in their poverty Neither is the Lord's face hidden from them, but when they cry out, the Lord hears them. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the sight of those who fear the Lord. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Let those who seek the Lord give praise. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of nations shall bow before God. For dominion belongs to the Lord, who rules over the nations. Indeed, all who sleep in the earth shall bow down in worship. All who go down to the dust, though they be dead, shall kneel before the Lord. 
Their descendants shall serve the Lord, whom they shall proclaim to generations to come. They shall proclaim God's deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying to them, The Lord has acted. The second reading is from Romans chapter 4. The promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but the, where there is no law, neither is there violation. You're going to read, Walter? Come on, you can come up here and do it. <laughs> For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of all, as it is written. I have made you the father of all nations, in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said. <coughs> Excuse me. So numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which is already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore his face, faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words that was reckoned to him were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. The word of the Lord. your steadfast love come to us, O oh Lord. Let your steadfast love come to us, O oh Lord. Save us as you promised, we will trust your word. Let your steadfast love come to us, O oh Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 8th chapter. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, but turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? What can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Your steadfast love come to us, O oh Lord. Invite the congregation to be seated. I'd like to invite our children forward for the children's message. Come on up.
How are you guys? Good to see you. Hi, guys. How are you doing? Abigail, thank you so much. Thank you. You can have a seat. All right. Abigail brought up something really important for us in worship. What do you see here? How would you describe this cross? Colorful. Colorful. Yeah, it's colorful, it's shiny. What else do you notice about it? Anything else? Old? Old? Yeah, it might be a little might be a little bit. It's a little bit old. And this cross was an important memorial uh, in memory of a family in our congregation. And that's a really nice way of giving gifts to the congregation and remembering those who have gone before us. And so this cross is one of those gifts. Do you see any other crosses around this room? Well, you're pointing over here. Oh, there's one up there. Okay, we're one over there. There's two over there, actually. There's one right there on the candle, and then there's one right, right here. What do you notice about those crosses? They're silver and shiny. And those crosses are the same crosses that we had when we worshipped upstairs above us in the sanctuary. And those crosses remind us of something really important. Do you know what it is? Jesus. And what did Jesus do for us? He shared God's love with us, and he even died for us on that cross. I have some crosses to share with you today. And one cross that I have was really important to me. This cross, what do you notice about this cross? Yeah, it's, it's kind of metallic, and it's, it's bronze. Or maybe, yeah, it's bronze. That cross was given to me by my mom when I was confirmed. And so you go through confirmation like Nina and Abigail here. Uh, you might get a gift from your, your parents, too. This cross was given to my mom when she was confirmed, and she handed it to me when I was confirmed. So that cross is really important to me. Here is another one right here. Here's one right here. Is what? A necklace? This is a yeah, it's a necklace. What do you notice about this one? Anything special? Um, it has Jesus on it. it. Has Jesus on there? Jesus on there. This cross is important to me because this was given to me as a gift when I became a pastor. The very first time that I became a pastor, this was a cross that was given to me then. Yeah, let's go. Let's talk about this one. This is a cross here, too. What do you notice about this one? Uh, it's kind of in the middle. Of the, the what do you see in the middle? There's another cross. There's another cross. What, what do you see around there? Uh, a heart. That's Martin Luther's seal. That's a special cross that he shared, and that was an important sign for him that God, in that cross, that God loves the world. And this cross was given to me as a gift from this congregation. So I cherish this cross as well, and I love to wear this cross. And I have one more here. Anybody want to hold that one? What do, you, what do you notice about that one, Fletcher? It is wooden. Yeah, it's kind of rough, isn't it? It's not as smooth as the other ones. That one's probably more like the cross that Jesus died on. It was wood. It was like a tree. And this cross is important to me because this was given to me as a gift when I first became a pastor, your pastor, here at Morningstar. So all of these crosses have different stories, and they all have different meaning, but there's one thing they all have in common. You all answered that question before. They're all a sign of Jesus' love. And Jesus tells his disciples today to take up their cross, to take up the cross. What do you think he means by that? To take up, if the cross means love, what do you think he meant by taking up the cross? Um, to, love to love others. And so when Jesus tells us to take up your cross, it means to put all of our faith and trust in God, in Jesus who died for us on the cross, and to remember that love that came to us 
through that death because on the third day, what happened? He rose, from the dead. he rose from the dead and he came back and told us how much he loves us. And so when he says, take up that cross, it's a reminder that we can take that love that he gave us and share it with each other. So I hope that when you see a cross or if you get a cross or your family has a cross, that you take time to look at it. And if your parents have a cross, you might, or your grandparents have a cross, you might ask them what the story is behind it, okay? Let's pray. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks uh, for your love for this world, for the love that you showed this world and each of us on the cross. Bless these children, bless their families, bless all of us here today with the message of your cross and the message that we too can go and share that cross, that love with this world. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming up today. Abigail, thank you. Ah, you can leave it here. Let's leave it. How many of you have ever committed or signed up to something that you were really excited about at first, you're really hopeful, you had some really good feelings about it in the beginning, and then you got into it, and you're like, oh, anybody like that? Okay, well, I might have shared the story, but I found myself doing that same groan, actually, when I was a pastor down in Kansas, and I took a group of youth to a camp, and we did a high ropes course. And the kids went up, and they were flying high on the zip lines and all that stuff. Pastor, why don't you come on up? And they didn't know how terrified of heights that I am, but not to be outdone by these whippersnappers. I climbed up on the pole, and there was a rope between two poles. You fasten yourself in a harness, and there's two people that guide you on the ground, and the goal is to get from this pole to that pole at the height of a telephone pole. So you climb up this platform. I got to the top, and I'm like, oh, froze in place. And my stomach was churning. I was sweating. I thought I was going to die. But I made it across, and it was an example of one of the things that I wish that I could have reversed course and regretted the whole thing when I got up to the top because I'm petrified of heights, and I didn't sign up for that. Sometimes signing up for things can have consequences no matter how promising or great it might seem in the beginning. The reality, of course, is that sometimes stuff happens in life after we've signed up and then we think about, in retrospect, why did we do this? Unexpected and unpredictable things can happen in life. That's just the way it goes. And the theme, that theme seems to kind of wind and weave its way through our scripture, our lectionary readings here this morning on the second Sunday of Lent. Take, for example, the story of Abraham and Sarah. And what did Abraham think he was signing up for in the first place? Well, God promised Abraham descendants, remember, as numerous as the stars in the sky. He says, you shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings will come from you, the almighty God said in Genesis. And then God says, I will make a covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout the generations and I will give you this land, this land of Canaan. What an impressive promise to Abraham and how important Abraham must have felt in that moment as being chosen by God to really be the cornerstone of an entire generation of descendants, a legacy of prosperity and treasure for generations to come. He thought he was signing up for something good, didn't he? But the only problem was Abraham and Sarah didn't have what? They didn't have a child. And as the story goes, Abraham and Sarah were so advanced in their years, well beyond, of course, their child-rearing age. And you know how the story goes from there. Abraham and Sarah began to doubt. And at one point, instead of trusting, just listening and trusting to God and His promises, 
They tried to take matters into their own hands. And even when they finally do have that promised son whose name is Isaac, his name means laughter because they chuckled so hard for even having a child to begin with. Even after they had Isaac, there's a story where Abraham is asked to go up onto a mountain and sacrifice his only son, threatening that line of heirs to come. Only the ram appears and Isaac is spared. Now, I think if we go back in time and maybe interview Abraham, I'm nearly certain that he would say something like, I didn't sign up for this. I don't even know what is even happening here. But that's also the same response that I think we could pull Peter aside this morning and ask him what he thought, pick his brain. What are your thoughts on what just happened to you? Remember how eager Peter was in the beginning with the other disciples to follow Jesus, to walk with him on those dusty paths of Galilee, to trust him. And at one point even declares him the Messiah, the Savior. Maybe Peter thought he was signing up to follow the next King David, who would rule with the strong arm, whose might and whose strength would provide peace and security for an entire nation of people. At least that's who Peter, I think, thought Jesus was when Jesus asks him point blank, who do you say that I am? That was the expectation of Peter. But it seems like an unexpected turn of events happens when Jesus declares to Peter and the disciples that he must suffer and then die and then on the third day rise again. What in the world did I sign up for? Peter must have asked. Get behind me, Satan, Jesus says to Peter, as Peter protests the raw deal that he thought he had received. Now, we look back with retrospect, and I think everything probably turned out okay in the end, and Peter was eventually forgiven and learned, I think, better to trust the Lord after he was risen on the third day, don't you think? But come on, was Peter really knowing what he was getting into when he committed to following Jesus in his ministry and his life? Well, I don't know. Did any one of you really know what you were getting into when you committed to some of the things that you did in your own life? Did we know as parents what we were getting into when we brought our newborn home for the first time and laid him on the furniture and wondered, what do we do next? What now? Did we wonder what we got into when we exchanged our vows in marriage or perhaps signed the papers of our mortgage? and now have an entire responsibility before us. See, I think we go into, as human beings, all kinds of things in life, excited and hopeful and thinking the best, but then the rose-colored glasses somehow come off at some point, and we see things for how they really are, the reality, and we realize that life is just full of what? Hard, hard work. Except once we're committed... It's not easy to just back out, is it? And in the case of some of our commitments and promises, it is truly until death do we part. And so once Peter and Abraham or any of the disciples, I think, signed up for any of the promises of God, I think they realized in that moment that there was no backing out. They couldn't just jump off of the Jesus train and go on to life as usual. And so likewise, you and I can't just jump off, hop off the train of life with these promises that we've received in the waters of baptism and just renege on all of that and jump off the train either. We're committed. We're committed because why? Because we have been first claimed. There is no backing out. And there is no reneging on the promises that God gave to you in those waters and the life that we, you and I, are called to live after we say that we believe in what God gave us in those promises. And then this morning we hear what I think are the trickiest 19 words of the New Testament. 
If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me, Jesus says. Those words, those 19 words are difficult because why? Because we live in a world that teaches us that instead of denying ourselves, that we should deny things perhaps like our own brokenness, our own sin. The honest to God truth is that we've been taught to put on that happy face in the midst of the struggles that perhaps we didn't sign up for in life. We might have been taught to hide the struggles from others for fear of looking what? Looking weak or looking vulnerable or perhaps the shame or embarrassment that comes so often with our own brokenness. Sometimes we tell ourselves lies like we're strong, that we can fix things without anyone else's help, that we're self-sufficient because we, in fact, live in a face and a culture that values our very what? Our very best. That's the way we're expected to live, right? Except is this really honest? Is this really being faithful to the gospel that teaches us that God loves you no matter what? That God loves you even at your weakest or your worst or your most vulnerable in life? After all, denying our own broken reality or the broken reality of others, of our neighbor, doesn't draw us any closer to being the person who God first called and claimed us to be in the waters of baptism. Jesus puts it quite plainly this morning in this deal that we're signed up for in this life of faith. That we can either deny ourselves or deny the cross. And if we deny the cross, might we also be denying the unconditional promise for life and love that goes with that cross? When I was a young man, just out of college, but before seminary, I lived in northern Illinois, Woodstock, Illinois, to be precise. And I had a great grandma who lived about an hour away. She was a great grandma. I didn't get to see her a lot when I was growing up, but we all called her, affectionately called her Momo. I had grown up knowing Momo as a very proud, kind, strong, well put together woman. That's how I remembered her because, but because of life and the distance from Omaha to Chicago, I hadn't seen her in some time. I was told <clears throat> when I lived up in Woodstock that Momo now had severe dementia from Alzheimer's and wasn't at her best. That's when I remember thinking to myself, well, I should go see Momo. I should really go spend some time with my great grandma, but I'm just, I'm afraid to do it. I'm afraid to go see her. And there was really no excuse, valid excuse for not seeing her, but I wasn't real excited about confronting this newfound reality. It's seeing a Momo that I didn't recognize. The truth of the very, the very truth of the matter is I didn't want to face the reality of not being remembered as Christopher, as her grandson. I didn't want to face the reality of her not being able to tell me how proud she was of one of her grandkids and all of the losing all of those things that come with such a cruel disease. But somehow I finally talked myself into it. I found the courage to go make my way over to her nursing home in Libertyville, Illinois, where I found Momo. She was sitting in a wheelchair all by herself at a table in the dining room. She had obviously just eaten dinner. There was a TV on nearby. No one else was around her. I sat down, and I don't think she recognized. I think I tried to tell myself that she did recognize me, but I don't know if she didn't. But I decided to just sit there with Momo for a few moments anyway. And it was in that moment that I think I learned a really important lesson. That life isn't always about me. It's not always about us. It wasn't about my need to be remembered or told how proud she was of me. And in that moment, I probably all I was to Momo was a very kind young man who had chosen to sit down and give her a little bit of company. 
It was about her needs in that moment, not mine. And so I decided to not try to confuse her with talk about the family or anything that I thought she might recognize and confuse her in that moment. I just sat there with her and accepted her for where she was at in that moment in time. And then <clears throat> none of us had signed up for this cruel disease called Alzheimer's, but I remember sitting there thinking it didn't change my love for who my great-grandma was. And so when I felt it was time to go, I got up and I wiped her, wiped her face. She had some food on it. I wiped her face and I gave her a hug. I told her I loved her and I left. And that was the last time I saw her. And yet, what a blessing that memory is for me and my family that we were able to cherish just those final moments with her. When Jesus says, deny yourself and take up the cross, it might seem easy to think that this isn't what we had in mind when we signed up for this crazy life of following the Lord. It might seem counterintuitive to what we're taught in this culture to pursue things like the American dream or all of the lies we tell ourselves that we always have to be at our best in order to be loved the most. But what if, what if by denying ourselves and taking up the cross that we actually in the process learn to live out what true servant love truly means? What if by turning back to the cross that we actually harness this glorious power of God's love perfected in weakness through his death for you on the cross? So if this is what taking up the cross means, sign, sign me up. Amen.
together and confessing our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in God's promise to reconcile all things, let us pray for the church, for the well-being of creation and the world in need. Let us pray. We turn, Lord, to you for meaning. Nurture in your children the gifts of the Spirit poured out in baptism. And let the mind of Christ guide your church. Give wisdom and discernment to our bishops, pastors, deacons, teachers, and leaders. Hear us, O God. We turn to you for renewal, that you save lives and ecosystems threatened by pollution Cleanse the earth's waters and restore the soil. Preserve rainforests, deserts, and wildlife that generations to come may cherish your creation. Hear us, O oh God. Mercy Lord, we turn to you for justice, that you uphold the worth and dignity of every person, especially those who function on the fringes of society, outcasts, and those who we keep distance. Hear us, O God. We turn to you, Lord, for healing. Send compassionate helpers to any who suffer because of war and violence. Shelter unhoused people. Befriend those who are lonely. Bring hope to any in despair. Console the bereaved. Lift up those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit in any way in our own community. We pray for Ray and Mike and Donna. Addie, Luann, Sandy, Elaine, Virgin, Neil. We pray for Bev and Emily, Campbell and Nick, Laurel, John, Kent. We pray for Mary and Don. Lord, we lift up to you the loved ones that we also hold in the silence of our own hearts. Hear us, O oh God. We turn to you, Lord, for purpose. Remind us now of your faithfulness to this congregation. Increase our trust in your guidance and keep us near your cross. Grant that our acts of service will express Christ's sacrificial love in all that we do. Hear us, O God. We turn to you for peace. We honor the saints who lived in service to others. Inspire us now by their example until you gather us into your kingdom. Hear us, O God. Accompany us now on our journey, God of grace, and receive the prayers of our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. I invite you to turn and share that peace with one another.
us pray. Jesus, you are the bread of life and host of this meal. Bless now these gifts that we have gathered that all people may know of your goodness. Feed us not only with this holy food, but with hunger for justice and peace. We pray this in your name. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that renewed in the gift of baptism we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord's table has been prepared, and all are invited. Be seated, please.
congregation to please stand as you're able. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Most generous God, at this table we have tasted your immeasurable grace. As grains of wheat are gathered into one bread, now make us one loaf to feed the world. In the name of Jesus, the bread of life. Amen. Beloved, we are God's own people, holy, washed, and renewed. God bless you and keep you. God shower you with mercy, and God fill you with courage and give you peace. Amen. Go now in peace and share the bread of life with a hungry world. Thanks be to God.